This evening we have a very interesting and I think from my perspective at least, and I'm sure I, you'll find from yours, an exciting member of the medical profession, a person who has experience in the area of law, a person who served in two sessions of the Congress in Washington, D.C., the 92nd and the 93rd, a person who, while coming from Illinois, now situated in Kansas, has studied medicine at Northwestern University Law at Washburn, and has been a participant in the formation of a number of pieces of important legislation associated with health and attendant related matters. Dr. William R. Roy is our speaker this evening, and he will deliver to us a lecture entitled The Future of Public Programs in Health Care. Dr. Roy. Thank you very much. If you listened closely to the introduction, you noticed that I have a degree in law and a degree in medicine. I've never claimed to be a lawyer. My wife and I, for some reason which we haven't figured out to this date, went to law school between 1964 and 1970 at Washburn and Topeka. It happened to be very, very handy. And in 1970, I graduated from law school and then shortly thereafter determined that I would at least run for Congress with the prospect that I would leave my practice of 15 years if I won. The prospect, incidentally, wasn't very, very good. But I thought I should call my mother back in Illinois and tell her what had happened. So I called her and I said, Mother, I'm going to run for Congress. And there was a long silence on the other end of the line. I said, Mother, are you there? She said, yes, son, I'm here. I said, did you hear what I said? I'm going to run for Congress. She says, yes. She says, I heard you. I knew if you got mixed up with a bunch of lawyers, something horrible would happen to you. I, uh, I am delighted to be here. I, I recall one other incident that I will pass on to you. I was speaking to a medical audience which was very much against the health maintenance organization concept down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and then later appeared on a panel with a good friend of mine, Dr. Ernest Sayward, and we were talking about that particular proposed law. And Dr. Sayward said, Bill, the thing wrong with that law is you're going to love it to death. And what he meant by that was we were going to set such high standards for health maintenance organizations that nobody would be able to qualify. Well, in a sense, I'm going to love you to death this evening. I'm going to extend to you from the beginning my sympathy because I'm going to read a talk to you, and a talk shouldn't be read. If I was an academician and could qualify this as a paper, perhaps I would have an excuse for reading it. And there are two things wrong with me reading to you. One is I don't read very well. And the other is that, unless I'm very, very careful, I'm tempted to comment on my speech as I go along. And uh, that sometimes can stretch out uh, the words that are on the paper. As you folks here know, nearly the people of nearly every industrialized nation have acted to guarantee basic medical care for every individual in their societies by establishing a national health service or a national health insurance program. They have acted and we will act because of the principles of fairness and equity. We accept that no one should die or suffer because he or she cannot pay for medical care or because medical care is inaccessible to him or her. But if we are to act wisely as we move to national health insurance, we need to know all we can about our current health system and the trade-offs that will be facing us and will necessarily be considered in any future health system. In addition, we must be as clear and realistic as possible about our goals and our expectations. Comment, I would underline expectations because I know many times our promises have exceeded, our promises and expectations have exceeded that which we've been able to deliver. And for these reasons, I'm very pleased to participate in this program. I congratulate you for calling it for attending it, and I also congratulate you upon your further plans to disseminate and consider further the information that you're gathering here these three days. While we can learn a great deal from the experience of other nations, the most important things I'm sure we're going to have to learn for ourselves, because we're pa approaching national health insurance not only at a different time chronologically, but at a, at a greatly different time measured in terms of medical knowledge and technology. Our health system is presently highly advanced and has well-established patterns of financing and care. 
In addition, of course, we have a unique economic system, and we also have deeply held convictions about the role of government and the responsibilities of individual citizens, which differ at least in degree from those of other nations, and which also differ from other periods of history in our own nation. While it's difficult to deal with changes which come about at an ever accelerating rate, there are three medical facts of life which are virtually undisputed today and which I hold will be true in the foreseeable future. I also believe that these facts must be used as guideposts as we make our plans and in the future as we measure our achievements. First, it is imperative that we realize that we cannot provide all of the medical care that is scientifically and technologically possible for everyone everywhere. Secondly, as a result of this limitation, we must decide what we're going to do for whom, where. And thirdly, we must always keep before us the fact that personal medical care, personal health care, medical care, is only one of the determinants of health and longevity. So I'll take a few minutes, if I may, and review these three points with you. And then after reviewing these three points, I will discuss some of the implications which I believe flow from these limitations. We cannot do everything that's scientifically possible for everyone everywhere. We as a society have long accepted this economic reality about nearly every service and product except health care. Victor Fuchs, an economist, has put the basic economic law simply and succinctly. Quote, the first is that resources are scarce relative to human wants. Second, is that resources have alternative uses. And third, that people have different wants to which they attach varying degrees of importance. I think this third one is particularly important in our economic system and our society. While we, 6% of the world's people, continue to consume approximately 30% of the world's resources each year, even we in wealthy America are beginning to realize the finiteness of energy sources and other raw materials, and to appreciate that nearly everything consumed must first be produced by combining capital, raw materials, and labor. The economic romanticism of the 60s is yielding to the realities of the 70s. Political leaders of every persuasion look at us seriously and repeat profoundly, there is no free lunch. Yet by choice or by happenstance, we are greatly increasing the percentage of our wealth and productivity that is consumed for medical care. Expenditures, and you've heard these over and over, I suspect, expenditures for health care have increased 500% since 1960, and the portion of the gross national product devoted to medical care has increased nearly 50%. The portion of the gross national product has increased nearly 50% between 1965 and 1976. The slice of the pie has increased by 50%. And as we know, our gross, when I was a partisan politician, I used to say in spite of eight years of Republican administration, our gross national product has grown over the last 12 years. Today, the average American is working one out of every 12 months to pay for medical care. Four prominent forces have caused the medical system to be characterized as a vacuum cleaner that will suck up all dollars made available to it. They are one, the expectations of patients, i.e. the value we place on medical care. This is perhaps best illustrated by the recitation of the belief that medical care is a basic human right. Two, the scientific and technologic revolution Three, the open-ended third-party payment programs, which we have for most of our citizens. And four, a physician ethic, whereby each physician tries to provide all health care, do everything that's scientifically and technologically possible for each patient. People undeniably value health very highly, and their expectations about the scope and efficacy of personal health services have increased year by year. Elitious Elich has spoken of this phenomenon as the medicalization of society. However, the single greatest force responsible for increased health expenditures is that we live in a time of scientific and technologic revolution. Medical knowledge, it is said, and I think they said it, I don't know who they are, 
has a half-life of four to seven years. Expensive products of medical technology have a similarly short half-life and therefore are constantly being modified or replaced by newer and more expensive instruments. Private health insurance for many people and government payment for services for some people have removed payment at the point of service as a marketplace regulator of the use of medical services. First dollar national health insurance would remove all barriers of cost. If this happens, it is predictable that nearly all people will seek any and all medical services of any possible marginal benefit, excepting those that are inconvenient, painful, or dangerous. Combining with third-party payment is the force of provider determination of services. We've heard about this again and again. Once one goes to a physician or other health professional, that health professional pretty well determines what tests will be run, what services will be provided, what surgery might be done, and so forth. And as I stated, we physicians are trained to use every available resource possible that may benefit our individual patients regardless of cost. We do not want to be 95% certain if an additional test or procedure and the associated additional expenditure will make us 97% certain. Furthermore, our patients expect nothing less. To my knowledge, this has always been so, and it's my expectation that in the one-to-one -one doctor patient relationship, this will always be so. Two other descriptions of our present healthcare system are helpful. One is Hyatt's description of the medical commons. He analogizes the finite resources available in our economy for health services with a limited commons available to herdsmen for grazing their cattle. He points out that a commons is not a marketplace <coughs> because all of the members of a society are entitled to use the commons. <coughs> Excuse me. Overutilization and ruin of the commons is inevitable because each individual rushes to use the commons in his or her own self-interest. Each herdsman adds one more animal until the grazing land is destroyed. We've adopted a health service commons for most Americans by the adoption of private health insurance for many people and the aforementioned government payment for services for some people. Many people contend that the passage of universal first dollar payment national health insurance would assure the destruction of the commons. The second helpful perspective is an economist's description of our present system. Today, most health institutions are paid on a fee for procedure basis, and most health providers, non-institutional providers, are paid on a fee for service basis, dentists, physicians, podiatrists, pharmacists, and so forth. Most consumers are required to pay little or nothing out of pocket in order to obtain hospital services, and nearly 70% of physicians' bills are also paid by third parties. Fee-for-service and fee-for-procedure payment result in what the economists call a positive marginal financial impact uh, each time a service is rendered. That is, the more services that a provider renders, the more income the provider realizes. First dollar insurance results in a zero marginal financial impact on the consumer. That is, each time a, a service is rendered, there's no financial loss or gain to the consumer. There are rare occasions when there's a positive marginal financial impact on the consumer if he or she can collect on two insurance policies, but that doesn't exist very often. This combination results in the maximum utilization of services. The provider gets more money and the consumer gets more services, and the third party, government or insurer, gets more bills to pay. There is subsequently a 15% annual increase in expenditures for health. As a result of these four factors and this description, costs go up and up at such a rate that few or none within our society will contend that it's mathematically or politically possible to continue indefinitely present trends in increased expenditures for health or that it is possible even in wealthy modern America to do everything which is medically and scientifically possible for everyone everywhere. We must decide what we're going to do for whom. This conclusion is a corollary of the recognition of limited resources for health. 
in any society, whenever there's not enough of something to go around, there are ways, formal or informal, organized or unorganized, less fair and equitable or more fair and equitable, of determining who gets what. Many people point out accusingly that any national health insurance law will be a method of rationing health care. This is so, but it's also true that today we are rationing health care by several mechanisms, including the barrier of cost for some people, and incidentally, while that may not be true for 185 million people, it may be true for as many as 30 million people, the inaccessibility of services for others, and for others, the inability to find a point of entry into a complex health care delivery system. For even others, it is a matter of chance whether or not they are beneficiaries of already limited resources. For example, who receives the single kidney available for transplant or which victim of aplastic anemia gets into the one remaining sterile cocoon. All nations with national health insurance, or as some might call their system socialized medicine, which indeed some are, are faced with the same problems of limited resources and the rationing of services. While they address the problems in a variety of ways, the most common resolution is for the government to determine total expenditures for health, where there is reasonable equality of access to existing services. There has been until this time little social or political strife, and nearly without exception, the citizens of these nations strongly support and endorse their respective systems of national health insurance or national health services. In sum, it is a matter of first magnitude of importance that we recognize and articulate that the most we can expect of any future national health insurance program in this country is equal access to limited basic medical services rather than all medical services. The third point I want to make is one that I suspect has been made several times in the previous presentations, but I'll take a little shot at it too. And that is that personal health care is only one determinant of health. There's a great deal of evidence that personal health services alone can provide only marginal improvements in health. One of the most persuasive arguments that I know for the need for health expenditures other than traditional medical services is the documentation in the Lalonde Report, A New Perspective on the Health of Canadians, of the causes of loss of years of life between ages 1 and 70. Canadians suffer early death as a result of five main causes. And these five main causes, incidentally, result in the loss of almost 60% of the years of life that are lost prior to age 70. One, motor vehicle accidents. Two, ischemic heart disease. Three, all other accidents. Four, respiratory diseases and lung cancer. And five, suicide. The report points out that most of these causes of premature death cannot be prevented or cured by the medical care system. Accidents and suicides obviously often result in death before any contact is made with the medical care delivery system. We also recognize that diet, lack of exercise, smoking, and environmental factors have a great deal to do with the incidence of the diseases of the heart and the incidence of cancer and other diseases of the lung. Very importantly, a great part of the money available for public health, immunizations, health education, environmental control, and similar purposes comes from public sources rather than private sources. However, the increasing costs of medical care to government, the $5 billion plus annual increase in federal expenditures for Medicare and Medicaid have resulted in less adequate public expenditures, i.e. governmental expenditures, for other health initiatives. In view of this experience, I believe we must measure each national health insurance program by whether or not it will so greatly increase expenditures for sickness care, medical care, personal health services, that we will spend less and less for other traditionally publicly financed health initiatives. The balance of this presentation, and this is the first time I've seen it typed, I hope my secretary didn't say you're on your own after page 12. We'll deal with four mechanisms for containing costs and thereby determining national expenditures for health. We're celebrating the halfway mark, so we, we, this is equally balanced, I guess, between this 
somewhat uh, long explanation and uh, the balance of the talk. I believe these alternative mechanisms should be measured by at least four criteria. Back again, I'm going to talk about four mechanisms for containing costs of health care. And these four mechanisms thereby determine total national expenditures for health. Now, what are these criteria? First, the nation's total expenditures for health should reflect the importance that the people of this nation place on health. That may sound vague and idealistic, but certainly that is compatible, I think, with very many basic beliefs. Second, total expenditures should assure adequate resources. This may be the physician in me speaking. Total expenditures should assure adequate resources to provide for a healthy nation commensurate with the state of the art and science of medical care. And if Lewis Thomas had been with us, he would have had a great deal to say about this. And also commensurate with our abilities to modify other health determinants. The first criterion preserves our respect for individual values and needs. The second criterion indicates a recognition of societal values and national values and needs. The harmony of these two often conflicting values is ultimately reconciled by government, essentially there's no other way, which determines the combination of market forces and regulation in the healthcare industry at any given time. A third criterion is how the cost containment mechanism affects the effectiveness and efficiency of the healthcare system. And time and time again, as we talk about these many things, at least as we talk in the narrower term of medical care, we should be saying, are we effective and are we efficient? The system is effective to the degree that it increases longevity and decreases suffering and disability. Or to put it another way, the medical care system is effective or other health initiatives are effective to the degree that they lengthen the number of years of useful life. A more efficient system provides an identical service or product at a lesser cost. A fourth criterion is whether or not the cost containment mechanism is compatible with the degree of equity and fairness, which are the first goals of national health insurance. I will discuss four cost containment mechanisms. Number one, arbitrary expenditure limitations imposed by government. Number two, process regulation. Number three, input regulation. And number four, a return to some market forces. While these mechanisms are not mutually exclusive, and there isn't much of a sociological nature that is, they do represent distinct approaches to cost containment, which are either now partially implemented or which are current proposals. Arbitrary expenditure limitations. This is the cost containment mechanism in current vogue. The popularity of so-called payment caps reflects the fact that nothing else is working at this time and that the legislative and executive branches of government, state and federal, view with alarm current rates of increased expenditures for health, primarily increased expenditures for medical care. So they're desperate, and in their desperation, they're seizing upon arbitrary caps as a mechanism which can be implemented rapidly. States are placing arbitrary limitations on expenditures for Medicaid, and they're also cutting back benefits for Medicaid interesting how they figure their fee structures or their payment for fee for procedure for hospitals. Oftentimes they figure out how much money can be allotted within a state government, the number of services that they can anticipate, divide services into the amount of money and thereby come up with a figure, which is the number of dollars paid for a service, which may or may not have any relativity at all to the cost of providing the service. But this is the way we have moved in recent years because of the tremendous impact of Medicaid on federal government, uh, uh, excuse me, on uh, state budgets. Federal government officials repeatedly propose caps on Medicare expenditures, and incidentally, that's bipartisan. Uh, President Ford proposed such a cap. The Congressional Budget Committees proposed such a cap as the 19, 
78 fiscal year budget was under consideration. And we all know that there's a hospital cost containment bill, which really is a misnomer, that's currently being considered by the Congress. This bill proposes federal government limitations on the increase of hospital expenditures for caring for all patients, including private patients who are not entitled to any government payment for their hospital bills. Expenditure limitations for Medicaid are widening our dual system. And we have a dual system and it's getting worse and worse and worse at one level of health care for the indigent and another level of health care for all others. And while we haven't quite done that, we're threatening to do that with Medicare. So then we can say the indigent, the elderly, and the disabled, and another level of care for all others. Physicians and other health professionals are withdrawing services from the poor. Almost anyone who could afford to seems to be withdrawing services from the poor. Because sometimes they get 60% of their usual charge, sometimes they get 50%, and uh, therefore, Somewhere along the line, I guess because they thought they were promised payment for taking care of the poor or for some other reason, they withdraw their services. Institutions are shifting costs to others. Government caps are much more likely to reflect the average American's abhorrence of taxes. In other words, if you can't tax and get more money in the government, you have greater expenses, you're going to have to cap expenses, or I guess or continue to write uh, deficits. What are we talking about this year? We're still in the 60 to 70 billion dollar range, I think. But anyway, if the government arbitrarily does this, they're more likely to be reflecting the public's abhorrence of taxes and the relative relation of health to other government priorities, rather than the real importance that the people of this nation place on health. If government arbitrarily determines total expenditures for health, such expenditures are not likely to be correlated in any way with the state of the art and science of medical care and the true needs of the American people. Caps may or may not increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the health care delivery system. And please don't get the wrong picture in this sense. There's certainly a great deal to be done in this area. But this will depend upon how providers are paid and whether or not we see considerably different organization of the health care delivery system than we have at the present time. The fourth criterion, the degree of equity and fairness under arbitrary government limitations of expenditures, depend upon whether or not government caps total expenditures for health or only places arbitrary limitation on government funded programs. In a sense, when the Carter administration talks about 9% across the board, as far as equity and fairness, that's a great leap forward. When we talk about capping only Medicare and Medicaid, it's obviously a great leap in the other direction. Process regulation, any form of government regulation. Government, local, state, and federal pays 40% of the nation's health care bills. Providers are paid on cost reimbursement or fee-for-procedure and fee-for-service bases. Providers thus have financial incentives to provide more and more services. In addition, government programs, as we know, have been beset by fraud. Retrospectively, it's not surprising that government programs have gone up, the costs of government programs have gone up at an even more rapid rate than, than total national health expenditures. Government's not dumb in its collective sense. So it's not surprising that government became quickly aware, I think they were aware before they passed Medicare and Medicaid, that in order to contain costs, government should not pay for unnecessary services. Government should not pay for services of less than standard quality. And government should not pay for services provided in costly but inappropriate settings. I try to avoid the term inappropriate because I don't know any term that is less appropriate than inappropriate. But we do sneak it in once in a while. In order to review services and bills for necessity, quality, and appropriateness, federal standards review organizations and utilization review committees have been established by law and at government expense. To date, these day-by-day, case-by-case, and service-by-service reviews 
as far as we can tell, have done little to contain costs. This is because, I believe, patients, physicians, and institutions frequently do not perceive utilization of PSRO activities to be in their best interest. For example, it's not perceived by the patient to be in his or her best interest to be removed from an institution where his care is paid for by insurance to a site where his care is not paid for by insurance, the home or some other facility. It is often not perceived by the physician to be in his or her best interest to take the time necessary for the efforts of utilization or quality review or to try to supersede his judgment or a colleague's judgment, particularly when you're talking about days of discharge. These are something that uh, are, are not uh, subject to uh, computers and absolute answers. It is not perceived by a hospital which is paid on a fee-for-procedure basis and which has empty beds to be in its best interest to send patients out of the hospital at the earliest possible moment. And because even government cannot expect individuals or institutions who rep or individuals who represent institutions to do the things that they believe are not in their best interest, these regulatory efforts, even with modification, have a doubtful future as effective cost containment mechanisms. Furthermore, if this cost containment mechanism, the one I just spoke of as process regulation, is adopted for national health insurance, and the best bet is that it will be, in all probability, this is what our national health insurance law, if and when we have one, will look like, literally billions of services will have to be reviewed either on a sampling or on a service-by-service -service basis. Third way of containing costs and determining total expenditures is input regulation. During the short time that I served in Congress, I began to recognize the myriad of problems associated with the two methods of federal regulation that I've just reviewed. Arbitrary total expenditure limitations do not seem likely to assure adequate resources to provide for health care for this nation commensurate with what we can otherwise do. And case-by-case -case regulation seems to be both expensive and ineffective. The major component of input regulation is the planning of the health care system instead of leaving its size and its function just to happen as a result of reimbursement and other forces. Other components of input regulation are the development of approved plans and sanctions to prohibit unplanned development. One major group of inputs for providing personal health services is facilities, hospitals, skilled nursing homes, and to a lesser extent, physicians' offices. Specific inputs, such as the equipment necessary to establish a cardiac surgical unit, renal dialysis services, and radiation therapy departments, further refine the nature and functions of the hospital. Each physical improvement requires the expenditure of capital, costs money. The Health Planning and Resources Development Act, which requires each state to issue a certificate of need for each hospital capital improvement is a capital expenditure regulation law. It's an input regulation law. The other major input for health services is manpower, the educated, trained, skilled people who provide services by using the facilities and special equipment that are made available to them. Recent federal manpower legislation, which mandates more residencies in primary care, is a crude manpower input regulation bill. While this law will eventually determine the kinds of positions we have available to provide care, it does not appeal, deal effectively with determining the numbers and kinds of health professionals who can provide services efficiently, but rather the law perpetuates the thinking that the more physicians we have, the healthier the American people will become. I don't necessarily think confession is all that good for the soul, but I went to Congress in 1971, January, and one of the first things I read was the Carnegie Report, where distinguished educators and others made the determination that we need lots and lots and lots more physicians, and we set underway programs which now have resulted in our medical schools having twice as many freshman medical students as they had 12 years ago. So. That input is more and more and more into the present time 
and I accept partial responsibility. It is apparent that at any one time the facilities and manpower available determine total health services available. Obviously there's some expandability in this, but generally this is true. And all or nearly all services available are likely to be used to capacity if the services are paid for, particularly on a first dollar basis, by private insurance or by the government. In some, in the absence of a marketplace, there are only two feasible alternatives that I know of for effectively limiting total health services expenditures. One is an arbitrary government cap on payment, which to be maximally effective requires government payment for all or nearly all services. The other is limitation of the size of the health care system by government control of inputs. If we cannot do everything for everyone everywhere, and we cannot, the least unacceptable alternative you ever hear a politician talking about least unacceptable alternatives? We were talking about politics at dinner tonight, and I'm two and a half or three years away from it, and I said that I, I can forget about it as long as people don't talk about it, and then I get a little bit excited again. So maybe that's uh, the reason I mentioned politics again and politicians again. But anyway, the least unacceptable alternative is for us to decide what personal health services we need, inexact as that determination may be, what personal health services we want and what personal health services we're going to pay for. And there are three different things. There isn't enough money in the country to provide all the services we want. There's a real question whether there's enough, enough money in governmental budgets to provide all the health services we need. And there's a great question as to how many health services we're going to pay for. But anyway, the least unacceptable alternative is to make these decisions and then to make certain that the facilities and skilled people are available to provide these services on an equitable basis to all citizens of our nation. Now, I've said at least once and maybe more than once, in the absence of a marketplace, and nearly all national health insurance proposals assume that there's no way to reestablish a marketplace for health services. The greatest hang up being, I'm sure, how in the world can a marketplace be equitable? And until recently, I have made this same assumption. But over the past year, I've become less certain as to whether or not we can at least, in part, establish a marketplace. So the fourth way of determining cost containment and total expenditures for health in this country might be a return to market forces, or at least to some degree, a return to market forces. Now, to show you how I felt a year ago, I wrote a little article and it said this, quote, total national expenditures for health would then equal the sum of hundreds of millions of individual decisions made annually. And based on the laws of supply and demand and the specific importance that the individual places on health services, this very effective means of allocating resources would require a law prohibiting first dollar private health insurance because your market effect is just the same, whether the money comes from government or whether it comes from private insurers. That isn't in there. To return to the statement, a return to market forces would also require either some kind of guaranteed income for each citizen so that each citizen could realistically make his or her choice to spend or not to spend for health or a continuation of government payment for health services for the poor. A return to market forces would also require modifications on the supply side, including antitrust actions and provisions for increased freedom of access to providers of services to the market. I'm not much of an economist, but I think to have a market one knows one has to have both providers and consumers. And if you have a cartel or a limitation of one kind or another, and the planning law could be one, as far as access to the market of providers, you certainly could not have a reasonable market. I wrote further, a return to a free market is exceedingly unlikely because of the obvious value that the American people place on health, the size of present day health bills, the present reliance upon health insurance, and the demand for equity in health care. End of quote. Since I returned to the private sector in January of 1975, I've become increasingly interested in whether or not it's possible to restore marketplace considerations to the medical care system. 
I've also become increasingly convinced that we have no marketplace today. I've become increasingly concerned, as I've already indicated, that we're likely to pass a national health insurance law which will continue the adverse incentives of the present provider payment mechanisms and which will fail totally or dismally to reorganize the health care delivery system. In addition, I've continued to observe the inefficiencies and ineffectiveness of most private industry that is heavily government regulated. And we're hearing this from the so-called liberals and so-called conservatives and everything in between as far as the air transport industry. We've seen it as far as the railroads. We're having increasing difficulties with our regulated utilities. And yes, we're even having difficulties with that symbol of private enterprise, the banks. I've been especially impressed with the difficulty government has mandating one action when financial incentives dictate another action. We have great areas of market failure in our economy, but perhaps even more distressing is how government reacts to market failure. An article by Charles L. Schultz, not known as a Neanderthal man, in the May 1977 Harper's, and taken from three lectures he gave at Harvard called the Godkin Lectures, and entitled The Public Use of the Private Interest, deals with market failure and the federal government's efforts to substitute, quote, a command and control approach to deal with the specific market failure, end of quote. Dr. Schultz finds that decisions begin, quote, surely this might sound familiar to everyone in the room, to be made on a case-by-case -case basis by the specific decision of regulators, by administrative hearing panels, and by the courts, all, often all three in sequence. Close quote. He concludes, quote, that we cannot afford to go on imposing command and control solutions over an ever-widening sphere of social and economic activity. And what I've indicated to you thus far, the process regulation that I see in healthcare is a command and control solution that ain't working, as are many other so-called command and control solutions. It is my observation that nearly all federal regulation of health fits in the command and control and case-by-case -case description, and to date it appears to be unsatisfactory. So a second look at a possible market and the probable results of competition in the provision of health care seems to me at least to be worthwhile. The most troublesome area in considering a restored marketplace is equity. But equity can be assured if government provides poor and low-income people with adequate purchasing power specifically for health in an amount equal to that possessed by other Americans. True competition, maybe I should read that one again, equity can be assured if government provides poor and low-income people with adequate purchasing power, not necessarily all purchasing power, specifically for health in an amount equal to that possessed by other Americans, or reasonably equal to that possessed by other Americans. True competition can perhaps be established only between organized health delivery systems or insurers who are required to be both competitive and at risk. Most insurance companies aren't at risk, as we well know. What they lose this year, they make up next year. It may be necessary to adopt prospective, excuse me, it may be necessary to adopt prospective capitation payment for divine medical services for a given period of time in order to establish competition and also to retain consumer choice. Just such a system would not rule out fee for procedure and fee for service if these two payment mechanisms or any other payment mechanism results in greater provider efficiency. But the test would be whether or not they are more efficient. It is not the purpose of this presentation to deal in detail with a plan for structured competition in the healthcare delivery system. It is my intention to interest you in, 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 in inquiring into the possibility of restoring competition and marketplace considerations to the provision of health care services as a part of a national health insurance program. At the very least, I urge you to examine carefully the incentives and disincentives that exist in our system 
and to determine whether or not they may be modified in such a way that government regulation can be lessened rather than increased and made more severe. Or I might say in such a way that government regulation can be effective. I realize, finishing this up, and my, where did the time go? It may have been a long time for you, it was a short time for me. I realize that my talk may leave you with a sense of frustration, and I share that frustration. As a physician, I would like for every physician to be able to do everything that's scientifically and technologically possible for each patient. My wants are the same as everybody else wants. Everybody wants a Mayo Clinic every 400 yards, plus a bunch of family physicians to go with it. As a family man, I would like for each member of my family to have accessible at all times, not just, quote, basic medical services, but every medical service that might be of marginal benefit to them. And I'd like to have the same thing for myself. People, if asked, automatically answer that they think everybody should have better than average medical care. I don't know of anybody in this room that probably wants average medical care. But people answer this question and make this statement, of course, without realizing the impossibility of such a goal. But the fact remains that it is no more possible to make immediately available and accessible to all people all medical services than it is possible to attain individual immortality. Our only choice is to act consistent with our individual value systems and our sense of fairness, equity, and justice and our concern for our fellow man and to work to make certain that our government is to repeat a recent successful theme as good and decent as the American people. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>